what's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Barbell Medicine YouTube channel. I'm Dr. Jordan Feigenbaum, your host. This is training vlog number 26. I know it's been a few weeks, so we've got a ton of training footage, a ton of your own form checks and questions. We're going to hop right into it. Make sure you stay tuned to the end of the video to figure out how you can submit your own question, your own training video for form review right here on our YouTube channel. So without further ado, let's hop into this. All right, so this first question is from Thomas Denhasi. He says, I'm a 26 year old that's been powerlifting for about a year now. I'm 190 centimeters and 128 kilos. So I guess it's like 6'2", 286 or so. Uh, just did my powerlifting, my first powerlifting meet and had a total of about 420 kilos. So that's a little over 900 pounds. Uh, now I want to go down a weight class for the next meet, which is in February. My question to you is, what would be an ideal program to execute for maximum weight loss yet retain as much strength that I have worked hard for? My thought, was going for the Texas method with cardio in between and one rest day, and of course track intake with my fitness pal, but I need help on the strength program. The problem here is the forced linear progression that seems impossible the more you cut weight. Any help is appreciated. You are a doctor amongst the bro science. Hey, thanks, Thomas. So I think a few things. One, linear progression is just a type of periodization model that can be used. It's not mutually exclusive from using things like RPE, percentages, block training, Basically, it's just a type of uh, progression uh, from week to week, usually, or session to session in the case of a novice. And again, you can use it in various different types of programs, uh, although it's not typically our uh, preferred periodization uh, and progressive overload approach. Uh, to your second question, should you do the Texas method? My answer to that would be no, um, for multiple reasons. The no, no, or the current form of the Texas method does not adhere to progressive overload principles. The average intensity doesn't go up, the volume doesn't go up, the amount of training frequency and exercise variety doesn't go up, and act, and so it does not adhere to the principle of progressive overload. It's not a good program to run post novice until you unless you modify it significantly to a point where it's no longer Texas method now, as far as where that line in the sand is where it's no longer Texas method sure that's up for debate but I would not start from the base template of Texas method and then adjust from there it's just not something I, I think is worthwhile to do there's nothing uniquely great or awesome about the you know uh, base template of Texas method that you should start there there's plenty of other uh, training programs out there that I think would be a better Start starting point. I feel the same way about five through one, and in fact, I wrote an article about this called "Into the Great Wide Open," which I've linked below. You can read that, and people will hate me on the internet for this. They'll say, "Oh, you don't like Texas Method? You don't like five through one?" I get more about the five through one. It's like, well, it doesn't mean that you can't modify the programs or structure them in a way that makes them productive for you. It's just, why would you start there? It you know, there's not a ton of you know uh, useful stuff right baked into the base template um, when that can be defined. So. I think I would start somewhere else. Uh, now you're asking, how should you lose weight? That's gonna be a calorie deficit. Uh, I've linked the uh, article below in, uh, to be a beast. I think that's a great way to um, set up your initial calorie intake and you should be in a calorie deficit because I would lose weight. 6'2", 286, and your total is just over 900 pounds. I think, yeah, you're probably carrying a little bit too much body fat if I had to guess. I don't know what your waist size is, so I've also linked an article below about how to measure your waist because I would be tracking those on an every other week basis. Um, and making sure that they're going down, just assuming that you're carrying a little, a little too much body fat. And I would actually expect you to get stronger if you trained with the appropriate programming, um, even if it, if it was using a linear progression type uh, setup, but I don't think Texas method would be my choice. I would use the bridge. I would do two days of GPP early on, which normally we wait towards the end of the program to get people into it. But for you, I think pursuing weight loss is a good idea. So I'd do the bridge, two days of GPP from the jump, I've linked that below along with how to measure your waist, the uh, how to set your initial calories using to be a beast article. And then also if you want to read up on why Texas Method and 5 through 1 are both inadequate or inefficient ways to set up your programming, I've also linked that article. And I expect to receive a lot of comments below about people who haven't thought hard enough about what I'm actually saying there. So sorry about that. Let's move on to the second question. All right, question number two, this is from Tino Coco. Uh, I've been living under the impression that if you eat more calories than you burn, you gain weight and vice versa. I know that macros matter to the point that our bodies as individuals react differently to different macro levels as it comes to perceived fatigue, body composition, and compliance. That's actually not, not true. Uh, but ah, my cousin linked me a video that tries to explain how fructose is a liver toxin and because of the way sugar metabolizes calories from it, it forms more fat than calories from some other foods even if your daily calories stay the same, another exclamation point. I have a hard time believing this. Could you shed some light on this matter? Sure, well, your cousin 
and the uh, video that I won't link because it's had over a million and a half views, or one and a half million views, uh, they're both just babbling nonsense that's uh, not scientifically accurate. So the video is made by this dance, uh, Nancy Lynn DeGregory. She is a PhD. She has a PhD in nutrition sciences from Clayton College of Natural Health. She calls herself a holistic nutritionist. And unfortunately, none of those things have any academic bearing. I can't really uh, recommend her or somebody with that type of degree or that professional title as a viable resource for health information. In fact, maybe just the opposite. The video itself is filled with rambling pseudoscience, scare tactics, fear mongering stuff that is, I suppose, designed to get people to change their behaviors for the positive, but ultimately, uh, I think you're supposed to buy pro some products after that. So I don't, I don't see it being that good. I mean, if you're gonna use something like, oh, fructose, you know, eating a bunch of fructose um, in the way of sugar sweetened beverages because it's in high fructose corn syrup, if you're trying to use that as a scare tactic to get people to change their behaviors and ultimately put them in a calorie deficit so that they lose weight, if that's your overall goal, I think it's a really strange way to approach that goal. Uh, and I don't think you need to lie about the actual science behind stuff in order to achieve that goal anyway, so I probably wouldn't use that. In any event, let's talk about the question at hand, like is fructose um, inherently fattening? Is it, you know, something we should be afraid of in any quantity and, and what do we do about it? So fructose is not a liver toxin. Fructose is a simple carbohydrate that is easily metabolized by multiple tissues in the body. Uh, we, if you're in a calorie deficit, it does not really matter what you're eating. And I would actually argue that the any sort of manipulation of macronutrients within a person's diet, uh, if they're in a calorie deficit, doesn't matter. So it doesn't matter if it's high fat, low carb, low carb, uh, low fat, high carb, low fat, whatever permutation, it doesn't matter. The only thing you can make an argument for that matters as long as you're in a calorie deficit is the si size of the calorie deficit mainly. And with the small, maybe secondary caveat to uh, uh, how much protein you're taking in as far as how much lean body mass a person loses while they're losing weight and uh, potentially satiety and potentially compliance tend to improve with higher protein intakes, especially as the carbohydrates are reduced. Um, proteins are also very satiating. In any event, outside of that, macros don't change the fatigue, The uh, uh, but maybe with the protein intake, yeah, sure, you could see the improved body composition comparatively, maybe. Okay, let's move on to this fructose thing. Not a liver toxin. Um, I would agree that consuming too much in the form of like sugar sweetened beverages, I'm probably not on board with that because it is correlated with other unhealthy behaviors like being sedentary, being in a uh, over overeating, so being a calorie surplus, and uh, and things of that nature. That being said, if you eat fructose in a calorie deficit, it doesn't matter. In fact, a study was done. So Londes et al. from the Rippey Lifestyle Institute, there's a bunch of researchers out of Florida, uh, did this 12-week randomized controlled trial. They had 160 obese folks. Their body fat was greater than 40. And they were put on one of four different diets. All four of these diets were calorie restricted, about almost 400 calories uh, was the restriction level. Uh, one diet had 10% of the calories from high fructose corn syrup. One had 20% of calories from the high fructose corn syrup. One had 10% sucrose. Sucrose is half fructose, so that's really about 5% of the daily calories coming from fructose. And the other one got 10% of sucrose, which is, uh, again, uh, about half. Uh, half of it is fructose. So in any event, there was no difference in how much body fat they lost. They all lost weight. They all lost body fat. Cholesterol levels all improved. Um, there was no statistically or clinically significant difference between the improvement. Um, and, you know, the thought, they, they had this really interesting quote that I, I want to read. Um, initially, there was a concern uh, that, was the, that was raised that there might be a unique relationship between obesity and the consumption of high fructose corn syrup because of the temporal or time association between increased use of high fructose corn syrup in the American food supply to the increased prevalence of obesity between 1970 and 2000. Despite the popularity of the suggestion, there are numerous reasons why this hypothesis should be discarded. First, the temporal association between high fructose corn syrup and obesity ended in 1999, when high fructose corn syrup use began to diminish. Uh, so basically, they stopped using it uh, as much in 1999, and so that <laughs> that the relationship no longer persists. And so, you'd based, why would you continue to talk about high fructose corn syrup or fructose uh, at this point? That's a good point. Secondly, numerous countries around the world have similar increasing prevalence of o overweight and obesity as the United States, but do not use high fructose corn syrup, suggesting that maybe there's something else going on on a population level that uh, in multiple different countries, uh, maybe even culturally. 
Uh, lastly, subsequent research and uh, studies have shown that there is no difference between high fructose corn syrup or sucrose in any metabolic parameter measured in human beings, including glucose, insulin levels, leptin, ghrelin, triglycerides, uric acid, appetite, or calories consumed at the next meal. So all this is suggesting is suggesting that fructose, you know, again, we may not love it as part of sugar sweetened beverage. Um, intake because again, it's correlated with other maybe potentially negative uh, or unhealthy behaviors, but we can't villainize one particular aspect of food uh, and we can't, you know, hang our hat that that is the cause, this is the problem. Um, so anyway, I'm not reposting the video that you sent me because 1.5 million views, well, how do I get 1.5 million views? You just to start making stuff up and I think people will watch. Uh, but yeah, that's... Uh, I'm not, I'm not really worried about the fructose intake, again, as, unless I'm trying to change behaviors, in which case I would advise against uh, sugar sweetened beverage intake, uh, for especially for overweight and obese folks. Um, that being said, I, I would not lie to them and say it's for the due to the fructose. I would say it's due to the extra calories, which would actually be have the benefit of being true. So, all right, next question. All right, this next question is from Jeremiah Woody. I've heard y'all talk about sports specific training before and understanding that basic strength training is a good place to start. I was wondering if y'all had any input on specific movements that a golfer could implement into their training other than just the regular squat, deadlift, bench, and press, or if just regular practice along with strength training should be fine. Thanks, any input would be appreciated. Uh, so the short answer to this is no, not really. I don't think that there's a case to be made for any specific type of exercise other than the ones you listed that would fall outside of our normal training variation stuff that we recommend. What I mean by that is there's not that one weird exercise that a golfer should include in their training that's uh, uniquely different than a non-powerlifting sort of application. And what I mean by that is if you have a person who's just trying to get strong in general, right, and across multiple different tasks, multiple different modes, then you wouldn't just have them squat, bench, deadlift, press. You'd likely have them do different variations, different tasks in order to improve their force production or strength in different contexts because they're not trying to specialize. So hyper-specialization needs to be reserved for, uh, you know, d dedicated athletic pursuits or if that's the only way you can get somebody to comply with training. But if I had a person who's never going to go to a powerlifting meet, I would have them do more variations. And that's the same way I feel about golfers. So we need to figure out if actually improving a golfer's strength would improve their performance. And in fact, the data suggests definitely that improving muscular strength uh, improves their performance on the golf course. In fact, the lower the handicap uh, all the way down through scratch golfers show increased strength and muscular power in the trunk, legs, and shoulder girdle, uh, also grip strength. And so I wouldn't uh, address any one of these like, you know, hyper specifically, meaning practicing the test that, where they're being um, uh, evaluated under, but rather I would try to improve leg strength, um, you know, with multiple different movements, including uh, different types of deadlifts and squats. I would try to improve leg power. Now that's a velocity dependent relationship. So I would probably actually do some more high speed training there as well. Uh, I know that shoulder girdle strength and power are also both uh, positively correlated with uh, uh, the handicap uh, thing. So basically, the stronger and the better people perform on these muscle tests, muscular tests, the lower their handicap was. So I would also do uh, very different variations of the press and bench press. And I would also likely include some speed work there as well, because that would help improve the velocity specific uh, strength. So in order to improve high velocity strength, you have to train at high velocities, you cannot do it slowly. There are different adaptations that occur in each process. Um, and the last thing, since the trunk uh, trunk power uh, has also been associated with the lower handicap, I'd actually probably do some medicine ball rotational throws. And that's, you see that all the time and people laugh at it and they say, eh, that's no strength conditioning. It's like, well, why wouldn't it be? You're, you're uh, training using an external resistance that allows you to create force against this external resistance at, at a very rapid speed. And so that's high velocity force production. That's how you train for power and uh, it's fairly specific to a golfer. Now, I wouldn't do that all off the bat. If I had a golfer who'd never trained before, it'd probably look uh, a little simpler, you know, 
less variations on the squat, maybe maybe two, less variations on the bench and press, again, maybe two or three, and less variations on the pull. But I would not hyper specialize them like I would a power lifter. And the differences between a power lifter and the golfer are that the power lifter I would have no high velocity uh, work because the, that does not contribute to the specific adaptations that you need to excel in powerlifting, which are low velocity uh, strength adaptations. But in golf, you do need some aspect of high velocity force production, and so I have to train at high velocity, so I'd probably do um, some dynamic effort work uh, initially, maybe once or twice a week at first on a newer trainee, and then more uh, later on, maybe even representing a 50-50 balance later on down the road for an actual competitive golfer, considering that training in the gym is unlikely to be the bulk of their total uh, training program, considering how much time they have to spend out on the course. And again, the med ball rotational throws, I'd probably do that um, for somebody who's uh, uh, no longer a newer trainee. So that's how I would train for golf. Uh, and so there's a few differences depending on the actual specific context. And again, it makes sense that a power lifter or a barbell sport athlete would train differently than a golfer and vice versa. All right, next question is from Evan Baker. Could you please comment on how you would train an athlete focused predominantly on getting faster and jumping higher? There's a large industry out there for this very question, but lots of advice seems kind of made up. That's welcome to the strength and conditioning industry. One topic I was most curious about is the idea that you can influence the amount of fast twitch uh, you can influence the amount of fast twitch muscle fiber you have. Is this true? Example I've read, long isometrics or slow supramaximal eccentrics uh, reorganize your muscles to have more fast twitch muscle fibers. Though that is not true. On the same token, I have read a focus on near maximal traditional lift transition, fast twitch fibers to slow ones. I would really like your opinion because I appreciate your logical sense or your logical responses and citing of scientific sources. Okay, so hey, Evan, let's jump into it. Um, let's start with a kind of background overview and then go through line by line here and see what we've got. So muscle fibers uh, have historically been classified into one of three different types. Uh, and basically there's slow twitch and then two different types of fast twitch muscle fibers. So slow twitch are type one, they're slow, oxidative, can go for a long time. Not, they don't create a ton of force, but they do so for a long period of time. And then there's the fast twitch and there's two types of them. One is type 2A and the other is type 2X. Type 2X uh, are effectively your very high velocity, very high force production muscle fibers, but they fatigue super, super quickly. So you would use those when you're jumping, uh, sprinting for very short distances, punching, kicking, for, you know, once or twice. But if you had to repeat the effort, you would uh, transition to using more type 2A fibers, which are still fast, still produce a ton of power and force, um, but last a little bit longer. So not quite as much force as the type 2X. Um, interestingly, now at present day, there are seven uh, different types of muscle fibers uh, that are commonly discussed in the literature. Uh, and the way they discuss these was by identifying what are called the myosin heavy chain or MHC isoforms. So what they do is they look at a muscle fiber under a microscope using a specialized type of stain and they can say, oh, this is MHC type one, type one muscle fibers, MHC type 2A, type 2X. The biggest issue in here uh, when discussing how they identify the different types of muscle fiber types is that a single muscle fiber may actually express more than a sing one isoform. Previously, it was thought that if you looked at a, uh, at a muscle fiber under a microscope and it was MHC type one, then it was slow twitch isoform. But now we know that that single muscle fiber can actually have more than one isoform, one heavy chain that's associated with it. So you could look under the microscope once and say, oh, that's slow twitch because it's got MHC one, but then it may also somewhere else in the muscle fiber have MHC two or two X or these different types. So that is a problem when assessing the evidence suggesting that the different muscle fiber types can switch um, between type one and type two, because that's the big question you're asking. Go, can one go from slow to fast or fast to slow? Um, the other question you asked in there was that uh, a traditional type of resistance training, can that make you go from uh, fast twitch muscle fibers to slow twitch. And that's not really what happens. Rather, you get a transition of type 2X fibers, those high velocity, very high force production, but uh, not very fatigue resistant muscle fibers, they convert to type 2A. So when you're in the gym, you're doing your sets of five or whatever, that's a conversion of 2X to 2A muscle fibers. That happens regularly. And so if you had a sprinter, jumper, um, somebody who had to, uh, who really wanted to focus on 
uh, being very, very explosive for a single or second, uh, or even maybe three top efforts, then you might want to focus on higher velocity training and not traditional resistance training with multiple sets, uh, multiple rep uh, efforts, which would again cause that conversion from type 2X to type 2A. That's been repeatedly shown in literature over and over and over again. And I've linked some studies below uh, that discuss that. Now, if instead of doing, you know, multiple sets uh, of multiple rep efforts, you do, you know, lower volume, single sets, single reps, or two reps at very high velocity, you get a change from type 2A to type 2X. Again, higher velocity force output, which would be good for when you need to um, create force at high velocities, like jumping and sprinting. So it just depends on the application. So I think if you were going to train an athlete who's focused primarily on sprinting and jumping very high for very short efforts, then you could make a case for doing high velocity strength work. And if you had an athlete who is primarily interested in powerlifting, then you would not do those things because you're interested in low velocity force production, kind of like the similar discussion we had on the last question. Um, let's give you guys a little bit more like this muscle fizz background because there's some element of your question that suggests that the amount, the relative amounts of muscle fiber types are trainable. Um, so using this sort of classic uh, categorization um, of slow twitch being a type of muscle fiber and then fast twitch being the other type and there's two subtypes of the fast twitch type 2A and type 2X, you know, can you actually influence how much of one that you have uh, that you have via training or is it more about something that you were born with? So untrained individuals, Costal and colleagues, uh, they did this classic study uh, where they assessed untrained folks and untrained individuals had about 50-50. So 50% slow twitch, 50% fast twitch. Um, in athletic populations, we see middle distance runners um, and endurance folks with 60 to 70 or even up to 80% of slow twitch type 1 muscle fibers. Uh, sprinters usually have 80% fast twitch muscle fibers uh, in this particular study. Power lifters, weight lifters have a little bit less, We're talking 60 to 70% fast twitch muscle fibers. And then ultra endurance and marathon specialists tend to have 40% um, uh, fast twitch, 60% uh, slow twitch. So again, the way that you would predict how someone, uh, uh, somebody's muscle uh, fiber ratio is between slow and fast twitch is exactly what you'd expect based on their sport. A weightlifter, you would expect to have a higher percentage of fast twitch muscle fibers compared to slow twitch. And an endurance athlete, you would expect them to have a higher percentage of slow twitch muscle fibers compared to uh, fast twitch. And this does not appear, it does not appear that you can actually change these things from slow to fast and fast to slow. Um, only studies that have shown that to occur is when people take the nerve, they either denervate, so they rip the nerve out of the muscle fiber because the uh, uh, normal or the, the default sort of muscle fiber type and the characteristics are fast twitch. So if you take the nerve supply away from a slow twitch muscle fiber, it'll change to a fast twitch. I probably wouldn't recommend doing that at home. <laughs> also, if you take the motor nerve supply of a fast twitch muscle fiber, uh, and you get uh, put it hook it onto a slow twitch muscle fiber, then that slow twitch will convert to fast twitch. So you can do that, but those are all surgical uh, procedures. Um, which, and again, the yield is unknown uh, because nobody's done this for athletic performance at this time. Um, you can't switch from type one to type two via training. And again, any there are a few studies that suggest that this might be possible. However, again, if we know that the way they're identifying these muscle fibers under the microscope using the specialized stain, if you know that you can identify different types of muscle fi uh, of the, you know, the different types of myosin heavy chains, MHCs, within a given muscle fiber, you could see how that could potentially be problematic and saying, oh, this muscle fiber converted to type two, it might've been there the whole time, or this muscle fiber, this fast twitch muscle fiber converted to type one, slow twitch, but it might've been there the whole time. Um, in any event, I listed, uh, I linked three, uh, no, four um, really, uh, really good studies on this below, so you can read into that a little bit more. Again, the TLDR, no, you can't switch between type one and type two, or type two to type one, you can't do that. You can switch within type two, the fast switch muscle fibers, you can go from type two X to type two A. Again, that's a little bit more fatigue resistant, high, high force muscle fiber, but it contracts at a little bit lower velocity. That's what happens when we do traditional uh, strength training. Um, and then you can go from type 2A to type 2X. Um, if you lower the training volume and increase the contraction velocity. So you can't just 
decrease the uh, the training volume and keep the intent and up the intensity that actually would not do anything as far as muscle fiber um, architecture goes you actually need to make sure that the intensity or the uh, velocity goes up all right next question from paul may uh hey my name is paul may i'm a follower customer from Brookings, south dakota i think you're the only one you're the one person from south dakota <laughs> uh i'm a 24 year old male five foot nine hundred seventy five pounds around 14% body fat. I'm currently on week seven of the bridge and plan on following it with two bouts of the 12 week strength program to prepare for competition in March. Uh, I will be competing in the 83 kilo class. I'd like to fill out the weight class while leaning down to about 10% body fat for both performance and aesthetic reasons. My planned method has been to slowly lose weight till I reach my desired leanness. And then I will slowly gain lean mass until I sit around 180 pounds. Am I going about this the right way or would it be better served with an isocaloric diet? Can an intermediate lifter effectively recomp on an isocaloric diet? Ooh, lots of questions here. Uh, so you're 175 pounds right now. You're eight pounds away from filling out the weight class uh, for 83 kilos. And you cannot do that while leaning down to 10% body fat. So as you gain weight, your body fat is going to increase, although the percentage may not change that much if you have favorable genetics. Um, it's unlikely that you can lose body fat while gaining muscle at the same time unless you are very untrained or very obese. Usually that does not occur um, unless one of those two are present. Now, you could uh, potentially lose weight and gain a little bit of muscle mass. If, again, if you have favorable genetics or, or are untrained or are obese, but for you specifically, I don't think that's a great plan. I mean, you're five foot nine, 175, and uh, your body fat's 14%. My recommendation would be to gain weight. I would actually have you gain weight up to over the 83 kilo class, maintain, and then maintain a few pounds over the weight class, and then cut down um, the one or two pounds or whatever you need to do right before the meet and see how you do. This is, you know, a powerlifting meet. Uh, I don't know how you've done in previous powerlifting meets, but you can only determine your competitiveness retrospectively. So you're suggesting that at 83 kilos and 10% body fat, which would likely take a few years to do from where you're at right now, um, you're at the idea that you'd be most competitive um, at that weight class with that body fat can only be determined retrospectively after you've done that. Um, you may find that you'd actually be a better 190, you know, or uh, 205, 93 kilo lifter or 74. It just depends. I don't know your numbers yet and, and they're not in here. And so it's hard to say prospectively if uh, you're on point here, but I would say given your body fat age um, and where you're at in relation to a meet, I would plan on gaining to a little bit above the 83 kilo weight class and then lose a little bit of weight going into the meet. And that's what I would do. Um, yeah. All right, let's move on to the next question. This is from Sunil Rao, 47 years old, 170 pounds, five foot six. I was progressing well on my lifts until about a week ago when I developed some type of gastroenteritis. My uh, oral intake was severely limited for three days during which I could only consume Gatorade and no protein. I've recovered somewhat, but still have limited oral intake due to GI upset if I eat too much. I went back to lifting this week and it's clear that I've lost much of my gains. I struggled to squat a weight 40 pounds below my max. I wonder, like a max at a five or max, you max it out on singles? Anyway, uh, as I slowly get back to a normal diet and increase my protein intake, I'm wondering how I should approach programming. Should I reset significantly and do the novice linear progression? So just a few things. One, your protein intake is not associated with your strength performance in the short term. Maybe in the long term, when we talk about lean body mass improvements, um, or lean body mass maintenance during weight loss, but a short-term protein intake has no effect on your, um, your, your performance. So we need to like divorce that idea. The other thing is I hope feeling better. <laughs> um, so I think it's a combination of not training for a period of time while you're feeling ill, acute weight loss, which apparently is likely due to de dehydration due to your decreased intake and the actual in intrinsic illness process themselves, as far as, you know, your having an illness and then the immune system's response to that, all of those combined, all those things combined likely produce your acute or short-term decrease in performance. And so what you should you do about that? I don't think you should do anything. I think you should return to normal training, normal programming, and as far as much as you have to decrease the load that you would otherwise use in order to get the desired, the correct amount of stress to get the desired training adaptation, do that. So if you're using percentages, then you may have to adjust the weight based on what you think your you know one rm is currently if it's rpe you're fine and if it's a discrete load meaning oh i'm supposed to do 220 for three sets of four uh today and you feel like you're about 10 percent weaker we'll knock 10 percent off that and you know sure there's some fuzz around how accurate and precise you can you know predict 
where you're at relative to your previous performance, which is one of the benefits of using RPE. You can you know, have a little bit better scale there. Uh, but I think I would just do the same program. I don't think I you need to go back to the novice progression. I think you need to get back to training so you don't suffer any more detraining and loss of mu uh, muscle uh, coordination and um, you know uh, skill with with respect to performing the lifts. And I think you should get your uh, oral intake back to where it was normally. And uh, I think as long as you're uh, rid of this disease, uh, then you should be okay. So that's what I would do. Let's move on to the next question. Our next question is from Edmundo Luis Vega. I just have a question about programming the rack pull from the mid shin as a primary pull movement instead of the competition deadlift. In this scenario, I would be performing a snatch grip rack pull from the mid shin as a secondary pull for the week. My rationale is I do not plan on competing in powerlifting. My main goal is uh, my main goal of these pulls is for hypertrophy of the upper back, and I have a tendency to injure myself via lower back tweaks mid to late in a strength program involving competition deadlifts. Uh, okay, so let's address this last part first and then go back into it. Um, this tendency to injure yourself via lower back tweaks mid to late in a strength program suggests that the acute on chronic workload has become too high and potentially some other outside factors as far as how if you expect that you're going to get injured and then you manifest this sort of pain response, pain experience, that's uh, uh, that's something to look into. I, I think more importantly is managing workload, managing fatigue. That's the most important thing. And if you're not able to do that currently, then that is a skill that you need to develop prior to passing go collecting $200. Um, I would look back historically and see what trends you can find amongst your uh, previous programming and see and pick apart, well, what worked, what didn't, maybe I should try this different thing. If that, if that means lowering average intensity, you can do that. If that means lowering volume such that you, you, know, you don't have this uh, excess fatigue that ultimately produces a pain experience for you, that's, you gotta figure that out. You can't just change the movements because again, I wouldn't expect that these two movements uniquely prevent you from or, or help you manage your uh, acute on chronic workload. I don't think that you can, uh, I don't think that's likely to happen. So I don't know if the movements matter that much outside of this expectation that you won't get hurt, in which case um, the expectation might play a role in you actually, the pain experience, which would be okay, but I will also not avoid movements um, rather, I would figure out this programming aspect of it. All right, so let's move on to this. If your goal is hypertrophy of the upper back, I don't think that snatch grip anything, snatch grip rack pulls or that rack pulls from the mid shin do better than a traditional pull from the floor. I don't think any of them are that good. I mean, they work the shoulder girdle and the traps isometrically. Um, and so and the range of motion is effectively is minimal compared to a thing like a row. So I think any virtually any type of row, if done for the correct amount of volume, uh, at a at a intensity that allows for uh, motor unit, you know, high levels of motor unit recruitment. So if you do a lower weight, you need to do it for more reps, um, such that the fatigue built up within the set actually increases motor unit recruitment. That's how you do that, and you likely do that for multiple sets. Um, I think that any row beats any pull from from that perspective for just straight up hypertrophy. I think that sure, if you're arguing at a snatch grip deadlift or snatch grip rack pull in, increases hypertrophy relative to a con, you know regular grip you know conventional grip deadlift you could make that argument until the volume gets high enough to where you reach the hypertrophy threshold from a single session in which case it just doesn't matter which is what i think is likely to occur so i don't i wouldn't expect to see more development from a snatch grip rack pull from the mid shin than a rack pull from the mid shin and in fact you're decreasing the range of motion of the actual lift um, with respect to the hips, uh, the musculature about the hips and knees and ankles, so the lower extremity, um, I don't think that's probably a good trade-off. I would try to figure out a way to pull from the floor. Now, if you can't get the programming variables sussed out, then maybe you try, uh, may, you know, maybe the rack pull from the mid shin is a great thing to do, and, you know, RDL would be probably a, a better pull than the snatch grip rack pull as far as, you know, overall development of the lower extremities and for upper back stuff i think you got to do rows that's and and presses that's that's what i would do um you know as far as development of the erectors squatting is going to help any type of pull like rdl or even this mid chin rack pull is going to be helpful but i would try to figure out a way to pull from the floor that's what i would do and if you do have some desire to get good at pulling from the floor then i think you need to do that but if you don't i don't care what kind of deadlift you do you would do trap bar deadlifts that's fine have you tried sumo deadlifts some, some people do pretty well with those. 
um, just based on the expectation and potentially the decreased amount of fatigue that the lower back uh, receives acutely. But again, it's all going to come back to, um, you know, workload management. And that's a programming sort of tenant that needs to be learned. And I wouldn't avoid learning it. So, all right, let's go on to the last question. James Meacham. Are there any benefits to supersetting primary exercises such as deadlift, press, squat, and bench beyond potential time efficiencies? I like that you called them primary exercises, like colors, you know? Uh, let's see, perhaps you could develop increased work capacity, conditioning improvement, hypertrophy, and or strength gains uh, given appropriate volume and intensity. Do you ever prescribe these and or utilize them yourself? So let's go answer these in backwards. Do I ever uh, prescribe these or utilize them myself? No, never, uh, outside of potential time um, improvements, um, not for the big lifts, um, because there's usually other, there are other aims that I'm trying to achieve. Okay. So we'll talk about that here shortly. Uh, they would actually compromise strength improvements if you did them this way, because, uh, you know, so again, deadlift and press, they're alternate they're, uh, there's no overlap really in the primary movers for the lift. Uh, so you're, uh, you know, the deadlift is mostly lower extremity. The press is mostly upper extremity. Sure, there's some overlap with the trunk. I get it. Um, but ultimately, since there's not a lot of pre-fatigue going on, um, effectively, the metabolic demands of the superset themselves become the limiting factor as to into performance, which ultimately compromises how much weight on the bar you can use. And you, you're not getting any additional motor unit recruitment from that fatigue. It's just This is just a metabolic uh, a systemic metabolic limitation or cardiorespiratory uh, limitation would be more accurate way of saying that. So yeah, if you wanted to get better at doing presses after deadlifts and that you were calling that an improvement in strength because your performance would go up, the better you got uh, adapted to this task, then sure. But it wouldn't improve your uh, 1RM to, you know, to 5RM, that kind of that weight. Um, I would not expect it to do that. I would, in, in fact, I would expect it to be worse because again, since the weight on the bar is compromised, um, you don't get the technique development, the intermuscular coordination, the voluntary activation of the motor units and the muscle tendon adaptations that uh, improve strength overall. And um, you can only do that through more heavier weights. For hypertrophy, I would expect no real difference, um, to be honest. I think as long as the volume is is substantial enough uh, or the uh, intensity used and then subsequent volume at that intensity is substantial enough to recruit high threshold motor units and therefore a lot of muscle mass and you're able to do that multiple times so to generate a hypertrophy response um, without uh, de developing too much fatigue that would be a way to do it because uh, hypertrophy is basically a function of uh, recruiting a bunch of motor units and doing it many times and then being able to do that again um, multiple times per week to increase the size of a muscle. So supersets, if you had uh, no, no overlap between the exercises, so a deadlift and a press or squat and a bench, so minimal overlap, you would not expect any pre-fatigue from the first exercise to exist and bleed over into the second exercise such that you would start recruiting higher threshold motor units due to the fatigue of the muscles that you're now working. Rather, you would expect this cardiorespiratory sort of limitation that would uh, compromise how many reps and how many sets you could do. But if you did like a bench press first and then a press afterwards, you're basically starting from this pre-fatigue state. And so you have to start activating higher threshold motor units, even though you're lifting lighter weights and that's going to generate an equivalent hypertrophy response um, provided you were going to you would do that a different way without a superset. So um, this is the same threshold, the same idea behind using myo reps. The idea is that you're using a lifting lightweight to near failure and that's causing a recruitment of a bunch more motor units and then you get to do expose them to multiple uh, sets, um, multiple reps where you're using those uh, additional motor units and getting and getting hypertrophy response. Now, uh, on supersets, you're going to do that only if there's overlap between the first and the second exercise. If they're just, if you're not using the same primary movers, then I think, again, you just end up compromising the volume and the uh, uh, motor unit activation because it's a cardiorespiratory sort of stress, not necessarily a uh, muscular fatigue type of stress.
um, you could, and with that in mind, you'd likely improve work capacity specific to that task. Um, since it's not locomotive, you know, like running, cycling, swimming, etc., I wouldn't expect this stuff to improve your swimming, cycling, you know, <laughs> anything like that um, much. I don't think the transfer would be that high. It'd be some non-zero transfer, sure. Um, just like I wouldn't expect that improving your running uh, performance would improve your ability to do this. Um, so that'd be a very inefficient way to go about improving your running and it'd be a very improved, just like it'd be a very inefficient way to improving your CrossFit just by doing running only and avoiding CrossFit. So I don't think there's really any benefit for doing supersets other than time. And it, the only time I would, I do them and that I recommend them is when people otherwise wouldn't be able to train due to time restrictions. So hopefully that answered your question. Let's get to the form checks. On De La Fuente, I believe this is 127 and a half kilos is 280, 281, something like that. Yeah, depth is pretty good on that first one, but it does look like your shins are staying too vertical. Yeah, are you touching the sides of the rack? Kind of looks like it. You may not have another option there. That one looked okay, just again, just right at parallel. The first one was below, those last two were right at parallel. And I think it's because your knees aren't going enough forward on the way down. I would cue you to put your knees forward, get them there by about the first half of the descent, and then keep them there on the way up. But your back looks pretty good, and yeah, that, that one was a weird rep. Yeah, just get your knees a little further forward there during the descent. All right, this is Bobby Anna's 315. Moving around a little bit, but... Yeah, depth is good there. Elbows look good. I don't know why you're moving the feet between reps. I don't like that. That one, there was some knee slide, but yeah, I wouldn't do anything about that. Just stop moving your feet between reps. That one was a little deep. More feet movement. Honestly, Bobby, I, I think a lot of this is just, it's going to go away. The more you squat, it's fine. I just stop moving your feet between reps. Just get real tight, try to hold as still as possible, and then get the set over with. Yeah, that's all fine. There's nothing egregious about any of these except for you moving your dang feet between the reps. Uh, this is Daniel Seymour apparently squatting. Is it basement? Yeah, you have the same problem as the first guy. It's just your knees need to go further forward during the descent. The other thing is, I mean, there's nowhere for you to bail. You have no spotters and you're a mile out of the rack. So I would walk out less distance. Yeah, your back looks fine though. Everything else looks fine. Just It'd be nice if you had a rack and I would get your knees further forward to keep them there. All right, this is Dan, Dan K, 135. You know, so the bar path looks great. I can't see your grip, so I don't know how wide it is. It, it does look a little wide here, but I don't, don't do the touch and go press. Do it from a dead stop. Pause it on your shoulders, do it from a dead stop, but your bar path's great. Mechanics look pretty good. I just would do it from a dead stop. Uh, this is Rex Ashcroft, this is 405. Now, so Rex, uh, you didn't set your back on that first rep at all. And yeah, second one the same. So it's not that you're not strong. 405 for five is a strong pull. Um, it's just you're not setting your back. It's not dangerous for you. It just, it limits your efficiency. And so I would, uh, I would have you set your low back. You're gonna have to lighten the weight to probably 315. And uh, you could do that as a supplemental pull. Basically, your second pull, you're gonna not let yourself round your back. So you got to set your back, keep it there. Also ditch the weightlifting shoes. Yeah. Uh, Isaac Rosenberg's 315 for five. Yeah, the first two looked really good. I don't love deadlifting in the racks. I'm afraid I'm going to dink the plate, you know, hit the plate on the way down, but it does look like you're, it's kind of a tight situation. Yeah, that lap, that rep right there, you didn't set your back as well. And you're actually a little bit behind the barbell. I'd probably uh, move that bar back about an eighth of an inch in your stance. Those last two reps, were a little bit behind, uh, uh, you were a little bit behind the bar, meaning the bar was a little forward of the midfoot. So I would actually pull the bar back in your stance a little bit, stay over it a little longer, you'd be all right. But so hips gonna go up a little bit, bar's gonna go back. Uh, what is this, 412, 187 and a half kilos? Yeah, not bad, Feigenbaum. This is over at Boss Gym. So all these clips, this is 365 by five, and I've already watched this, the pauses were a little, yeah, those first two were super fast. Bar path is good, but the pause, if this was supposed to be a pause bench, I, maybe it wasn't. Just crap. 
but 365 for five is good. So what you're seeing in all these videos uh, is a hybrid between when I was finishing one block, which was like a specialization block, lower, lower reps, higher intensity, and then the start of a new volume block where the reps are much higher. So this is pin bench. Uh, I just want to put this in here since I rarely put something like this in here. Notice that I'm pausing the bar to dead stop. Yeah, and then I'm really just focused on the concentric. That's why I put that in there for folks. So those are all at the end of this specialization block. And now I'm on this volume block. So this is 130. This is actually a wide grip bench for me. I normally bench with my pinkies about one finger with inside of the power ring. Here I had my uh, second finger on the power ring. Now this is a BNR bar. There's two marks. Yeah. Austin and I are laughing because I wanted to stop at nine and he said, no, dude, you got another one for 10. Uh, so this is also on the volume block. This is, uh, let's see, 145 kilos. So what, 319, three, yeah, 19 or something. Yeah. And I'm doing this for a set of eight. These pauses were pretty good. Yeah. Leah's not impressed. You can't see her face, but she's not. You just got to trust me. She's not impressed. All right. And so this is at the end of that specialization block. This is actually down in Hawaii. This is 365. I'm going to do this for a triple. Now, one thing's interesting. You'll notice I grab the barbell and I use that to lever myself into position. I, trip, I typically like using the rack to do it because I think it's more consistent. Um, I don't know why I sometimes don't do that, but there you go. Yeah, 365 for three looked pretty routine. So was, uh, things were going well at the end of this specialization block. I might have considered extending it one week longer, but this is 385. And again, you notice I didn't use the rack to like lever myself in position, but I used the bar, which is fine. Yeah, that one is a little forward off my chest. That one, I pushed it back enough. That's good. Yeah third one too. So that looked pretty good. I probably could have could have gone up, but I was feeling the effects of Hawaii. This is 370. It's like get the bro stuff out of the way in the first place, you know? Yeah. That was pretty good. That one was better as far as pushing the bar back towards the rack on the way up. Third one, all good. Yeah, I don't have any complaints there. All right. Uh, so again, this is the end of the specialization block. So I'm gonna pull a single. This is 650, I believe. Maybe six. Yeah, I don't see any chips on there. So yeah, just doink the bar forward. If you go back and watch that, you also see that it came off my left side. I can see that from the front. Basically, that left side, you see it hanging off my leg. Um, so I don't like that. And also, the Rogue logo, I can see it move. So when filming from the front, you can just watch the logo of the plates to see if when you push your shins to the bar, if the bar moves. Watch. Yep, sure enough. Just kick the bar forward. Made 606 feel a little harder than it should. Yeah, it's just felt hard, which... Yeah, you can see the bow my face. So this is 550. Um, I'm gonna pull this for eight. Again, we'll watch the Rogue logo. We'll see, does this thing, do the does the logo roll? Does it move or not? Because if it doesn't, then I'm keeping my hips to the appropriate height. I'm not nudging it forward with my shins. And you don't see it move. Oh, so fast. So fast. That's a face only a mother could love. Well, not my mom, but you know. Yeah, I don't have any problem with any of these. I actually think my lockout looks a little better than normal. Like I actually like stood all the way up. Sometimes I don't do that when in a higher rep set. Yeah. Now this is, uh, let's see, 260 kilos. So what is this, 560, 573, something like that. 260, 520, 573. Yeah. Yeah, again. The, that's why the thing's so fast. You don't see any movement of the bar forward, like figured out how to deadlift all of a sudden. Great. Or you could say that I have delayed training effect on my deadlift from the previous block that I wasn't able to realize in the previous block. And then you're in this constant loop of saying, oh man, should I keep going or should I stop? So just retrospectively, you have to pick, pick you know, 
uh, pick a path. Yeah, so I actually thought I was gonna throw up here at the end of this set. So I did, I've done seven. I'm gonna put, get this to my knees and set it down because I'm like, oop, you know, throw up. Uh, and then again, this is, so this is my, I'm, I'm doing an RDL for my supplemental pulls. So SD1, day four. So this is 500. I like that I, I block my head off and I also like that I stick my tongue out when things get hard. So I like to do my RDLs from the floor. And the idea is that you're gonna trace the bar down your legs, get to a few inches below your knees and then stand back up. Sometimes I'll program these with a different eccentric tempo. Um, other times I'll just try to do them uh, heavy, you know? Uh, I don't know if you can really overload RDLs compared to uh, regular deadlifts, especially if you're a good puller, but that might be different for people who are not as good of pullers. Uh, I just like it for, uh, if I have to do something for higher reps, I like that better than, you know, rack pulls, for instance. So this is five, let's see, 230, so this is 507. Why, I, just keep your dang mouth shut, dude. Gosh, no wonder you're single, you know? You just, Keep your mouth shut. Yeah, I think if I was coaching somebody how to do these, I would have them take a Valsalva before every rep. Um, I'm, I don't know why I'm just being a little extra and not doing that, but that would help me, I think, keep my back, my especially my upper back, locked in place. I really felt this in my lats afterwards and my hamstrings and glutes. So I guess uh, maybe I wasn't doing it all wrong. Uh, and then again, flashback to, this is in Hawaii. This is 607 from a deficit. I did this for three triples. This is uh, like the um, the end of that specialization block. So yeah, these are okay. Just, I think the, it, it felt like the bar weighed a different amount on each side because we're using these junkyard plates, which is fine, but yeah, rated that an eight. Just to prove everyone that I just, I still squat. So this is 425, 430, something like that. Yeah, for a set of eight. Now, this is the first time that I low bar squatted with a belt for over, uh, it had to be at least two months. So these felt really strange. And I squatted yesterday, they felt much better. But um, the first time I ever low barred in like two months was this pause squat that you'll see in the future. But as far as these squats, they look okay. Yeah, I don't really have any problems with them. That last one could have gone a little deeper. And I think my shorts are getting a little too small. Hashtag peach gang. So this is actually the first time I, I low bar squatted in two months. Now at the end of that specialization block, I should have been doing safety squat bar, paw squats, but uh, they didn't have that at this gym. So I ended up just doing low bar for triples. So that's 405, felt okay. I hadn't done that low bar for a while because my wrist, my hand, I had the skateboard induced hand injury thing. So anyway, so this is 445. Yeah, I mean, these are all, all okay. Not bad for the Hawaii uh, effort. And this is 455. So as I worked up to 455, I was like, I guess I can still low bar. That pause should have been longer. But I actually think this looked faster than that 445. Yeah, those first two reps for sure. And the plates aren't really rolling, so I'm keeping it on my back. Nice. Yeah, so ideally my elbows wouldn't flap up. And that first rep would have been pause a little longer. Uh, all right, this is to Baraki. So this is, so he was doing pause squats as well. Basically, I just figured I'd do what he was doing. He's getting ready for Raw Nationals. So we got a lot of Baraki footage from now until the end of the video. So sit tight for this Baraki training montage. This is uh, 475. Yeah, people ask about that little shrug thing he does when the weight gets heavy, and I, I think it's just a volitional, you know, he's trying to do a big Valsalva, and so I think he's gotten the habit of doing this, which increases the uh, superior inferior uh, distance and maybe his thoracic cavity a little bit, allows for the apical aspects of his lungs to expand maybe a little more, so he feels like he gets a better Valsalva. Should you do that? Don't do it. He does it. It's just his style, you know? He's also got a good looking deadlift face. Uh, you know, maybe you do want to replicate that. I don't know. Uh, so this is 515, 520. That pause there kind of sucked. Also, if you rewatch that, which we're not going to, you see the left side kind of drift forward. I think it's just the asymmetry in the stance. So if you, anytime you see the bar switch like that, just look at the, make sure the stance is symmetrical first. So as far as like, are the heels lined up? 
Are the toes lined up, toe angle and everything the same? Uh, this is 545. This is the Instagram angle. You do, you do this to get discount code in bio. One, two, yeah, good pause. Yeah, 545, beltless. I had to help him get back in the rack. So this is uh, 480, yeah, 480. So let's see how his pause was. One, two, yeah, that one was a little like right at depth and then probably could uh, pause longer there. One, two, yeah. I guess I should have counted louder for him. All right, so this is some more squat footage as he's getting ready for Raw Nationals, which is this week. This is 600. That one, you saw him shift his hips back, which you'll see that on this rep set too. Now, I don't know if it's because the whip on the bar, that Texas Power Bar whips a little bit more than the 29 millimeter uh, Ohio bar, but just watch his hips out of the bottom. Normally, he doesn't do this, but you see that kind of little scoot. He normally does not do that. He's really good at staying in his knees using those quads. Um, in fact, we like using the term leg drive over hip drive when it comes to the squat so people don't shift their hips back. But this is 605 in his garage. Yeah, he's better at keeping his knees forward out of the bottom on that particular rep and it's heavier. And this is 625. Yeah, even better. So 625, not bad, leading up to raw nats. This is 545, or 550. I feel like that we should have like a Rocky theme song. What is this? 605 again. See, yeah, that one is a little, just a little shift of the hips back, but it, some of the stuff is stylistic, right? And so it doesn't need to be cued. Anyway, this is 170 kilos. So Austin has been working his bench back up under the care of Michael Ray and Derek Miles. They're both working with us for pain and injury rehab consults. So if you want to do that, you can contact us for that. They've been helping Baraki here who couldn't bench, you know, 225 without pain a few months ago. And now this is 180, it's 396. I'm giving him commands, which I think you should do if you're going to a meet which he is, Raw Nationals this weekend. Probably the next training vlog will have Raw Nationals footage in it. And this 405 self lift off, which I think does, you know, you do better with the lift off and you misgrooved it a little bit, but 405 self lift off in a garage. Nice job, Austin, nice job. All right, so this is 550. This was back in Seattle. So he's doing pause deadlift. Now all of these pulls are forward of his midfoot. And I told him that after every rep. Now, it doesn't mean that he won't be able to deadlift a heavy weight. It's just, it means that he's got more in him. This is 600, so that was 550. This is 600, one, two, nice pause. Good finish. Now this next one's gonna be 633. And the bar is well forward of the middle of his foot. His hips are a little too low here, but, and the bar is, comes off his legs. That's why the speed slowed down. So you gotta keep the bar on your legs and he'll, uh, Actual eight with the bar an inch off of your legs. Yeah. yeah. So what? How do you feel about those isometric lat contractions? I feel like it hurts right now. Yeah, yeah. Got a little back pain, but you know it's tolerable. So she just pulls six thirty three. All right. So deadlift montage. This is a six sixty five. Get ready for on that. See if we can chase down that seven hundred pound pull on the platform. This is back in Hawaii. I believe this is five, uh, let's see, so that was five, 12, five, 62, five, 82. Paused, looks nice. This is 602. And these ones don't look to be as far forward as the ones from Seattle, which was a week, uh, two weeks after. But yeah, just notice how, how much higher his hips are. Yeah. The speed through the middle is a little bit better. Weight's also a little lighter, but you know how it goes. Calm before the storm. People always ask like why there's that sort of, you know, mental, you know, you, people like shout or, you know, grunt or some other guttural thing. And it's, I think a lot of it's just to get focused on the task at hand. So this is six, yeah, 620, 623. A little forward compared to the last rep. So that being said, that looks going well. So, hey, that is training vlog number 26. I apologize for the delay. I'm not traveling as much for the next uh, couple of months. 
fingers crossed. But hey, if you want to submit your own training video for review, uh, you should shoot it uh, landscape at 1080p or higher. Use a, a service like WeTransfer or Google Share or something to share the video with us. Send it to media at barbellmedicine.com. There's more info in the description below. If you have a question, send it to media at barbellmedicine.com. Hopefully it's a good one. We will feature it here on this training vlog. And guys, thank you so much for watching. We'll catch you next time. See ya.